go ahead. Oh, okay. So um, all right. If we could just have the fans taken down a bit, that's physical stuff. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Stephanie Barber and I am the Master of Ceremony for today's event. I would like to welcome you all to the 2023 graduation ceremony on the Bachelor campus here in Bachelor today. I am a Miriam Sampai, Sumsep and Dobbo woman from the Torres Strait Islands through my mother's lineage, family lineage and Yandra Wanda woman in Aminka, South Australia from my father's lineage. I am a graduate of Bachelor Institute Charles Darwin University and Deakin University. My involvement and experience in Aboriginal education spans over 20, 22 years. I am committed and passionate about education for First Nations people and the approach in which Bachelor Institute undertakes through its both ways philosophy, where First Nations and Western knowledges, cultures and practices come together. Firstly, a bit of housekeeping. In the event of an emergency or fire, please muster towards the left near the road behind the stage towards the basketball courts. Toilets are located at the back of the hall to the left behind us, as well as an all abilities toilet to the far right. A first aid tent is located on the left should you require any assistance during today's proceedings by our friendly volunteers. To our, right, to our left, thank you. Furthermore, before the academic procession, procession commences, I please ask for all mobiles to be placed on silent, flight mode or turned off throughout the ceremony. The academic procession will walk to the song Buffalo Stampede, a well-known band within the Northern Territory and throughout Australia, Black Palamujic, with the lead singer, Mr. Peter Miller, in whom is a previous graduate graduate of Bachelor Institute. The academic process is now commencing. Leading the academic procession is Canarican traditional owners and custodians, Elder Uncle Speedy and Jack McGuinness.
Thank you, everybody. On behalf of the Institute Council, I would like to acknowledge the attendance of our Kanarikan and Wairai traditional owners and custodians and land in which we meet and gather today. Our sponsors and VIP guests, representatives from the public and private sector are here with us today as well, as well as staff, students of the Institute, our graduates sitting here before us today, and their family and friends in joining us on this special day today. To open today's proceedings, the Institute Council and staff would like to recognise students and staff who have passed on in 2022 and 2023 by observing one minute silence. Please join me. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Bachelor Institute would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, sea, waters, and communities throughout Australia where we live and work. We pay our respects to, th to the traditional custodians, their cultures, and their elders, past, present, and emerging. As we share our knowledges, teaching and learning, and engage in research practices within the, this institute and or conduct business with a variety of external agencies and organisations. We must always pay respect to the sovereign status of our hosts. May their ancestors always be remembered and honoured, the elders listened to and their respected, all members treated with dignity and fairness in the present and well into the future. I would now like to call upon Ms. Pat Anderson, AO, the Chair of Bachelor Institute Council, to address all graduates. Uh, 
afternoon, everybody, and once again, thank you for coming to Bachelor to honour and graduate all of our students every year. We have this wonderful um, ceremony. Thank you, Stephanie, for the welcome, and I too pay my respects to the Kanarakan and the Warai people, and I've known Kanarakan people all my life. We all went to school together. I'm from Darwin. I'm an Aliara woman, and this is my, this is my home. So um, I'd like to thank you for the generous welcome. It's, my, it's always, always a pleasure for me uh, to be here on this beautiful country. And as I said, I've been coming here since I was a kid. I'm big number now. <laughs> thank you for the invitation to address you on this important day where many of you are graduating from your studies at Bachelor Institute. Congratulations to all of those who are graduating today. Huge achievement. Your commitment to, to developing your skills and knowledge to work with your families and your community is something of which to be proud. I'd also like to acknowledge the families of all those who are graduating today. They really couldn't have done it without your continuing support. However committed, it's an essential part of all of the achievements today. Getting an education is not always an easy path to follow, and the support of your families is what gives us strength and makes the journey possible. Today, I'd like to share a little of my story with you, along with some of the lessons I have learned about education and its place in the Aboriginal movement for self-determination. I grew up in the 1950s in Prep Camp in Darwin. At that time, <laughs> speedy nose, Prep Camp was home to many families rejected by the mainstream Darwin uh, population. There are a few other groups that share that space with us as well. There were lots of um, Greek families, some Chinese families as well. You know, we were at, the, at the time, we were the bottom of the social pile uh, which we shared uh, with some of, the, some of the other groups who came a long time after us. Many of those families had a stolen generation heritage. My mother was one of them, taken by force from her family in Central Australia as a young girl, young girl sometimes in the early 1920s. My father was a Swedish merchant seaman who had ended up in the Northern Territory. In those post-war years, conditions at Prap Camp were harsh. There was no electricity, no pipe water, and the toilet way down in the bush. <laughs> so what improbable chain of events, you might ask, led me from Prap Camp in the 1950s to being with you here today? Well, I was a bit lucky, but two things were central. Education and the struggle for social justice for our people. It was public policy of the day not to teach my mother to read and write. Of all the terrible things that happened to her, that was the one she was most angry about. So we went to school, rain, hail or shine. The system that removed her from her family, supposedly so she could better herself, denied her that opportunity. But both she and my father were determined that their daughters, I come on the six of us, no boys, uh, would get an education. So, despite the hardships, my sisters and I went to school, as I said, every day without fail. And the path that this education up, opened up for me eventually led me out of Darwin. It led me to Tasmania, to Western Australia, to Melbourne, and then to Geneva, Holland, London, New York, Israel and New Mexico, and eventually back to Australia. It led me to getting a degree in English literature from the University of Western Australia in the 1980s. I'm the third ever Aboriginal person up at that university opened in 1930, and I was the third person to, get, to graduate with a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Western Australia. There are others there now, but I was number three. The first woman, um, she died, and actually the second graduate, and she came from here. I knew his mother, um, so, uh, and uh, he still lives in Western Australia. But anyhow, that led me to a career in the Aboriginal movement for health and education and self-determination. It was my education that made that possible for me. So when people talk about the importance of education, 
It is easy to dismiss it as just another cliché, but I can speak from my own experience about how profoundly important it is. I would, like, I would not like you to think that through a, that education by itself solved all the issues Aboriginal people like me and generations of us continue to face year after year. At that time, I was completing my formal education. We were still denied many essential human rights and the subsequent path of my life was deeply linked with the struggle to realise those rights. This is, this is with all of us Aboriginal people of my generation. The key marker, of course, was the 1967 referendum. Over 90% of Australians voted yes to change the constitution to ensure, amongst other things, that we would be counted as Australians for the first time. So for the first time in my life, I was in, all of us were included. We were still excluded in many ways, but that was a bit of a watershed moment in 1967. Today, just as in the early 60s, we are energised and focused on a new movement for constitutional recognition. This was expressed at the National Constitutional Convention of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at Uluru in 2017, which adopted and the Uluru Statement from the Heart. That statement sums up where we see ourselves now and what we believe needs to be done to move forward for social justice. Following from the Uluru Statement later this year, we will, we will have once in a generation opportunity to vote in another referendum, this time to establish a First Nations voice to Parliament and to the Executive. I will be voting yes in that referendum. It is, it is, I believe it is an essential step in establishing a fair and respectful relationship between this country's first peoples, Australia's first peoples, and those who came after. How you vote is a matter for you, but I ask that you consider the matter very carefully, that you inform yourself of the issues at stake, and that you make your vote on, the, on that basis. For those of you graduating today, I have two favours to ask. First, value your education. Use it, build upon it, use it to serve your families and your communities. Getting formal education as you have done at Bachelor Institute is important, but it's only the first step. Use what you have learned to develop an attitude of learning throughout your life. Those of us lucky enough to have been given the fundamentals of a good education should recognise the precious nature of the gift. Education is a gift. And with that gift comes the responsibility. It does place, puts us in a place of responsibility to do the best we can and to give back um, wherever possible. The Bachelor Institute will be there to support you in this work, always seeking to ensure that we are meeting the changing and dynamic needs of your communities and indeed your families. So link to this, so link to this is my second request for you all. Get involved. Don't be a passive bystander in your own life or that of your community and your families. All of you have the ability. You have proven that by graduating today. You know the conditions that your families face. So use that knowledge along with your formal education to make a difference to make it better, to improve, to push. Every one of you is needed, now for goodness sake, more than ever. Our world is getting even more complicated. Ask yourselves, what do I want to see for my family and my community? What do I want to see for Australia? What, of, what kind of country do I want to live in? Ask yourself these questions as part of a commitment to lifelong learning and a sense of solidarity with others. I've been privileged to be part of the journey towards self-determination and social justice for our diverse peoples for many years. But the next step in that journey will be taken by your generation, not mine. You're coming on the stage and we're leaving it. I invite you all to take that path to shape the future of your communities, your families, the Northern Territory and indeed the nation state. This is the challenge I leave in your hands today, I think very capable hands. Once again, congratulations and thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I would now like to call upon the Chief Executive Officer, Mr. David Cusack, to welcome all graduates. Good afternoon, all. Hope you can all hear me at the back. All good? On behalf of the of Bachelor Institute, I would like to begin by paying my respects and honour to the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered today, the Kongara Khan and the Warai peoples. We honour the traditional guardians, the cultures and their elders of yesterday, today and tomorrow. I pay tribute to the traditional guardians of the land, the sea, the waters and the communities throughout Australia, where we live and where we work. May their ancestors always be commemorated and honoured. May the elders listen to and respect it. And may all members be treated with dignity and equity, today and in the future. Graduation is one of the most important events for everyone at Bachelor Institute. Today's ceremony symbolises the achievements and successes of our graduates. All graduands are here today to demonstrate their hard work, commitment and perseverance to complete your studies and obtain qualifications that will set you up for a new imagined future. These qualifications will not only open more employment opportunity and study pathways for those of you who seek them, but also serve as an inspiration for other students and potential students in your families and communities more widely. On behalf of Bachelor Institute, I thank and congratulate you for all for everything you have achieved with us and for the contributions you will make to your families and communities as you put these new learnings and practice for those around you. I congratulate and thank all families, friends and communities here today for supporting our graduates in their journeys at Bachelor Institute. I'm sure I can speak for all Bachelor Institute uh, in wishing you well on your next journey. We are proud of what you have achieved and your accomplishments. And we are also happy to welcome you today as a graduate of 2023. And on a personal note, this education is a, is a, a journey that some of you are taking, that have taken now for the first time, some of you for, have done it before, and it never ends. And the attitude towards learning is important, because we don't just achieve uh, in a graduation award, and the learning stops, the learning continues. And so some of you are on your way already, some of you are starting out, and congratulations to all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cusack. I would now like to call upon the keynote speaker for today's ceremony, Mrs. Nuresa Bulsey. Nuresa is a Miriam Sunset and Dubai woman from the Torres Strait and a graduate of Bachelor Institute and Deakin University. Nuresa has been involved in Aboriginal education for over 40 years in the Northern Territory. She shared her teaching experience as a classroom teacher in an award-winning resource for new teachers, Indigenous education in Australia, learning and teaching for deadly futures. Please welcome Nuresa Bulsey. Hello, everyone. I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we celebrate Bachelor Institute graduation, the traditional owners, Kamarakan and Warai peoples. I pay respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. I would also like to extend the respect to all indigenous families here today and those that are watching the ceremony online. I would like to acknowledge our council, Bachelor Institute Council, 
the dignitaries, students and families, staff and visitors. I'd like to share a little bit about Aboriginal education. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island education is a unique lifelong learning journey. It is a cultural journey and it starts when you are born and continues throughout one's lifetime. During the journey, one must attend school. At school, Indigenous students are taught Western ways of learning, such as counting, the alphabet, colors, cutting, pasting, and so on. This is a part of the Western ways of education in the first stages of the student's schooling. It is very puzzling that there is no actual assessment before Anne to gauge what the Indigenous student knows and brings to the learning. Indigenous students cannot be truly assessed in a Western education learning place without the support of Indigenous communities. So then the activity and delivery continue in the Western form. Whereas the Indigenous ways of learning is taught and received in a holistic way that is real and meaningful to the Indigenous culture, ways of knowing, being and doing. Indigenous ways takes you on a journey that links all learning together. It does not give you pieces to put together like a jigsaw puzzle. I will now like to share some true accounts of classroom activities. The X-ray drawing. An Aboriginal early childhood student in a community school shared a story of an X-ray drawing of a barrel mummy for a morning talk. The student knowledge of their cultural ways was intertwined in the morning talk. Why? Because the student could do it. Because at the time, they had an Aboriginal teacher who was then a graduate of Bachelor College. A teacher who was not from any Northern Territory Aboriginal community. She encouraged the student to share a story, and guess what? She did. By sharing her cultural knowledge that day in the morning talk activity was never going to be jeopardized because she was in her community with an Aboriginal teacher who encouraged her to share a story and respected what she brought into the learning space to share openly. The drawing showed that the student had excellent fine motor skills, a motor skills that was developed well and truly before entry into any Western learning place. Fine motor skills just went out the door. Could this have happened in any school? Don't know. But one thing, there was no way one could have planned for this in the teaching program. She was so skilled. Indigenous students need Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander teachers who can make the student learning journey a place of belonging, and this was evident that day. The student intertwined their cultural knowledge and weaved it into the Western knowledge system like a mat. The next one I want to share is the sky is grey. This story was shared by a classroom teacher of a young Indigenous student. The question was asked of the students, what color is the sky? The student raised his hand and gave his answer, the sky is gray. No, it isn't. It's blue, said the teacher. The sky is gray. The teacher looked out the window and said, the sky is gray. The teacher said that day changes must be made. When asking questions to indigenous students, it must be asked in a lived and now question for today. Not a question that has been embedded in our minds that the sky is blue. It may be blue one day, but can be different on any day. The answer to the question on the day was given when the sky was gray. What good came out of that? The student was right, and the teacher recognized that teaching indigenous students, changes must be made to the way one teaches. 
the student was looking at the sky through his cultural lenses. Indigenous people use their cultural lens in a lived experience for the day. The last one is the secondary students. The school was an independent secondary school with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. The school day started and when the students arrived, they were asked to position themselves where they thought best in the classroom. This freedom to arrange and position themselves helped the teacher to learn about the students' relationship with each other and the teacher too. When the students finally positioned and seated accordingly, the question was asked, is everyone sitting where they are supposed to be? And their response was definitely yes. What a picture it was to see the students having the freedom to culturally place themselves in a Western learning space. Crumbs. You see, the students place themselves according to their kinship systems, which are very important in terms of cultural rules, protocols, and social connection. Most of these students come with the cultural knowledge of their complex kinship system, taught to them from birth and reinforced throughout their childhood, and now as young men and women. It is important to always start by building and establish good relationships. To establish good relationships with students, it is important to connect or reconnect with each other if some of the students were previously in the class. The indigenous teacher was guided by a cultural lens, her ways of working, being, and doing, preparing the learning space for relationship building and community engagement. For this to occur culturally appropriately and culturally safe, the students must have the freedom to bring and use their cultural knowledge in the classroom. It can make a statement about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students cultural knowledge and cultural activities are their ways of knowing, being and doing, and now these ways go beyond the curricula. It was about providing a space for Aberdeen and Torres Strait Islander students to have the freedom to contribute to our own learning and teaching environment. It was only after this activity that the students' names were placed on the desk according to their seating arrangements. By doing these things, in this way, the student knew that the space was theirs and they had ownership over it. And that's the end of my talk, but I'd like to congratulate all our graduates that are graduating today, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to come and speak. Thank you, thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Bullsey. I would now like to call upon the Bachelor Institute Council Chair, Ms. Pat Anderson, AA, to present the academic awards to respective graduates. I also call up Executive Dean, Higher Education and Research Associate Professor, Dr. Catherine Gilby, to present candidates and the students to the Bachelor Institute's Chair of Council for the conferral of Higher Education and Research Awards. So, um, today's a very auspicious day. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. McGuinness in the front here, and Jack, and Donnie, and all the Kumarakan and Wai in the audience and the graduates. We see you. We see you in your hard work and your commitment, and it's a big heartfelt congratulations from me to you to get here today. And the award that I'm giving, that I'm going to be discussing, the reason I say it's an auspicious day, every graduation is an auspicious day, this is an incredible event, because it's all about your hard work. Today is the first time a Kunarakan person has received a PhD on Kunarakan land from this institution. It's no small day today. I 
I'd like to acknowledge Professor Brereton. Can you stand up just quickly? For her extraordinary supervision of the candidate and her real commitment to this institute. I'm going to, Helen's given me a little bit to read, so I'll, um, I'll take a minute. This is for um, Uncle Speedy too, this is for Okmarakan. The Honorary Dr Kathleen Mills was the last active Omuyuk of her generation and invited the researcher, Okmarakan woman, living on country to hear, record and learn from the bestowal of her Niawat. Niawat is both the knowledge that sustains Konarakan people and the process by which that knowledge is passed on. The researcher, her daughter, niece, Chuanga was to seek out, receive, and document knowledge of the Konarakan world. Information is drawn from conversations and interviews. Th this thesis reviewed the literature on colonization and its devastating effects on Konarakan people, yet it demonstrates how the knowledge and practices of the past, which enabled Konarakan to survive for thousands of years in the most arid country in the world, have not been extinguished, Information is scattered across different documents and sources, but it was not lost. Other voices then joined this research to form a fugue, to give the reader a taste of, what, of the way in which traditional learning and teaching took place, through repetition and reinforcement, within the context of structured relationships. Knowledge about the world is represented through the mukunakana, I don't know how badly I butchered that, but... <laughs> which embodies the cosmology of Konarakan people to illustrate their life cycle. An important finding is that language is the vehicle in which near what is contained and can be passed on. This thesis uses Konarakan language where possible and provides support for offering language programs as a way of preserving and reviving culture. The thesis is also the story of a relationship between Omoyok Morodo and the researcher. And in the final chapters, it was her insistent need to bestow near what towards the end of her life and as she passed on to the ancestors. And so the knowledge that she has bestowed on the researcher feeds into new discoveries which will inspire and encourage Kunarakan people in the 21st century. Madam Chair, can you please hold up that this is the thesis that we're going to give to Helen. We've just picked it up. This is what commitment looks like. This is knowledge transmission in this day. Madam Chair, I would like to call up Dr. Helen Bishop, the first Kunarakan woman to receive a PhD from Bachelor Institute. Thank you, Dr. Gilby. I now call upon Senior Lecturer, Education and Early Childhood, Art and Business, Ms. Evelyn Shaber, to present graduates to the Bachelor Institute Chair of Council for the conferral of Bachelor Institute Fed Awards. Welcome, Mr. Shaber. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm actually honoured to be up here while, to, while um, our doctor receives her, her doctorate, but I'm, I'm here to actually give out the VEDA word awards. And my honour is that um, Bachelor Institute gives out certificate ones right up to the postdoctorate to a doctorate degree. So today we're covering the whole spectrum of, 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 degree, of, of certificates. So I'm really proud to be up here to do that. Okay, first of all, I'd like to call on those students who have 
You have completed all the academic requirements for the Diploma of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Primary Healthcare Practice. Vanessa June Lynch. Roxanne Juliet Sambo. <laughs> Glenda Trindle. I'd now like to call up those students, the student who has completed all the academic requirements for the Diploma of Early Childhood Education and Care, Rewak Arafin. I'd now like to call up those um, students who have completed the academic requirements for Certificate 4 in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Primary Health Care. Uh, Anthea Anthony. <laughs> Jacinta Tatipata Smith. Jane Sell Wills. I'd now like to call upon the student who has completed all the academic requirements for a certificate for in education support. Julie Ann Bonavita. I'd now like to call on the student who has completed all the academic requirements for Certificate 3 in Business, Crystal Cragen. Now I'd like to call on those students who have completed the academic requirements for Certificate 3 in Community Services, John Allen Barber. <laughs> Candice McGuinness. Janan Yusarama. Who's also completing the Certificate 3 in Early Childhood Education and Care. I'd like to continue for those students who have who um, completed the academic requirements for Certificate 3 in Early Childhood Education and Care, Elvina Damarangi. <laughs> I'd 
Zelda Demarangi. Quintina Gondara. Linda Henna. Amanda Johnson. Grace Kumbi. <laughs> Priscilla Lorenz. Relma Luther. And finally, Anika Rory. I'd now like to call upon those students who have completed all the academic requirements for the Certificate Three in Education Support, Samantha Damarangi. Carolyn Demarangi. <laughs> Thomasina Duncan. Anastasia Lanson. I'd now like to call on the student who has completed all the academic requirements for Certificate 3 in Screen and Media, Michael Raymond. I'd now like to call on 
the student who has completed all the academic requirements for Certificate 2 in Community Services, Aisha Pointer Gambley. I'd now like to call on those students who have completed the academic requirements for Certificate 2 in Conservation and Ecosystem Management, Jamal Hur. <laughs> Tyrese Miller. Edward Sellams. I'd now like to call on our final student who has completed the academic requirements for Certificate 1 in Workplace Skills. Delina Wilson. That comes to the end of the conferral of awards, but prior to me leaving, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all of our industry partners in the audience who have made it possible for our students to attend Bachelor Institute to be able to graduate here today. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Shaver, and thank you, Ms. Anderson. I now call forward Ms. Lee Hewitt, who will present the Harry Wilson Memorial Award. Lee Hewitt is the station manager of TIBA, the top in Aboriginal Broadcasting Association, and a Bachelor Institute alumnus who graduated in 2012 with a certificate for in screen and media. This award is sponsored by TIBA and recognizes the outstanding achievements of a graduate in screen and media. This year, the Harry Wilson Memorial Award goes to Michael Raymond. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hewitt, and congratulations, Mr. Raymond, again. <laughs> Chair of the Council and members, the ceremony is almost complete, but it is also important to remember the people that celebrate the, this graduation, these being the graduates. Chair of Council, on behalf of the students who have graduated today, the student response this year will be provided by Dr. Helen Bishop, a graduate in the Doctor of Philosophy, Indigenous Perspectives. Dr. Helen Bishop is a Canarican woman of the Northern Territory, Australia. Her academic focus continues to enlarge culturally effective governance, particularly in procedural fairness, dispute resolution, problem solving, and participatory agreement making. Helen's champions dispute resolutions to enable 
greater use of restorative justice practices, their therapeutic jurisprudence, effective governance, and peace building, practices extend compassion into First Nation communities. Please let us welcome Dr. Helen Bishop. and graduates. I don't know a Kungarikan word for graduates. I just said, a beautiful day. Kieran Mac, sweet, and good to see you today. Welcome parents, elders, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, grandparents and grandmothers and grandfathers families, and those who bring us here today, my fellow graduates. I make a special note here to acknowledge Warai people for their footprints and ours share in this country. Yet here today, I speak only for my Kungarikan Guinea, my belonging. Yet I recognise an equality of existence with Warai in this, in this special place. I'm deeply honoured today to address all of you on this momentous occasion, the Bachelor Institute's graduation ceremony of 2023. I am proud to be a member of the Kulmarican people and on whose land we gather today. For together, we celebrate not only our personal achievements, but also to pay tribute to the rich heritage and resilience of our ancestors. In this revered place, known to us as Ulmoni, our forebears gathered to celebrate trade tokens, exchange uh, arrange marriages, and strengthen bonds, and plan complex future events. Today we participate and we bear witness to the power in our shared histories. With our attendance on this graduation ceremony, celebrating our success and our progress. I extend my heartfelt and very deep appreciation for the custodians who are my ancestors and the elders of this land, both past and present, because they watch over us today. And I thank them for their investment and patience with me. My task in research was long and the road was sometimes quite worrisome. Yet they showed me what needed to be shared, seen, recorded, and I thank them. Their wisdom, guidance, an unwavering spirit shaped the values some of us hold dear, yet in many ways lose track of, and I can say this for all of us, for the distractions that come with modern Western life. As graduates, we step forward and bring with us our ancient languages and ancestral stories which mingle into the social soul of this nation to further enrich our collective identities. As graduates, 
we embarked upon a journey of knowledge seeking and growth and self-discovery to strengthen our futures, our languages, our cultures, our skills and our identities. For our education extends beyond the classroom. Our education brings with, our, with us our communities and our people, for they will benefit from our new skills. Our education echoes through our languages and resonates across our environments. Our education helps us to connect with our community's needs, interests, aspirations and our futures. Our education reminds us of the brilliance of our ancestors in a time when they send out detailed message sticks. In a time where there were no telephones, where there was no colonisation, these communications were long planned for enormous ceremonies with many land groups across great distances. They were well prepared, polishing their ceremonies, organising their gatherings to feed many and to satisfy their cultural and spiritual obligations to one another. For they had to complete these tasks effectively. They did not have a calendar or an iPhone to give them an alert. They had themselves. For they couldn't be distracted by those last minute things. For their relationships and kinship systems relied on this close attention to detail. So it is a myth that white fell away brings attention to detail because First Nations had been planning these complex multi-party events without the use of simple use of modern technologies at our fingertips. I beg you to challenge the suggestion that we country men and women did not plan well in advance because my research became an intimate and oral accounting for our practices. It became a journey dotted with travel across the evidence held in our country, in land claims and books, in documents and hours of interviews and recordings. It was the journey of many lifetimes. And I say this because in searching for meaning in all the records held of Kulnarikan voices, in the etchings and images from the written word, and there were eons of voices speaking back. While elders ensured they accounted for themselves, it is we remaining Kulnarikan who must embrace the record of our heritage our responsibilities to take on the form of Mukunakanak, that is the cycle of life for Kungurukun, and what this means to truly be Kungurukun Guinea, the long Kungurukun. For any colonial accounts of overlaid and eroded Kungurukun peoples, language, heritage, knowledge, and our pre colonial selves. Our true history, the story that is ourselves in this country. Prior to colonisation, Kulnarikan society was imbued with Kulnarikan knowledge and filled with language of fluency. And our lives were full and filled with cultural being and meaning. The ancestors instigated and participated in their ancient ceremonial rites and practices because this is how our Kulnarikan ancestors related to their world. It was how they embraced and engaged with the ecological estate prior to colonisation, for it was all they held most dear. Nothing else distracted them. By examining our records and following the themes raised by Al Mount Mordup, the voices of elders were enabled to smoothly agree with the ancestors' approach in nourishing detail. 
It was only when I positioned myself within the logic of narrative inquiry and in the song lines of ceremony that I could learn and relive the ancient methods and patterns generated by Mapupak, our ancient ancestors. It is through this method that I was to, able to realise and ascertain the power in speaking Kung American language, for it altered how I engaged my thinking, my behaviour and my perceptions to align with the intention of our ancient selves. I could locate through oral story and effective research method while the voices of elders enriched all that our milk had shared with me. By reliving those casual moments in time, such that my PhD explores, records and recovers, it is highlighted in pho photographs I took of Kungurikan iconology. For this small sa sample held an enormous authenticity for every Kungurikan. It has as it represented yet more evidence upon that already revealed in my research. That not only did we come out of this land, but we have indelibly left our sung, spoken and inscribed record upon it. Our American world, while challenged by colonialism, held in enduring and respectful relationships to collaborate with each other and our neighbours, to form the foundations of our cooperative existence. Now I say this because I became aware of just how powerful our own Kungurikan ancestors were. For they shaped the nature of our former social systems, gave meaning to our names and duties we together would perform. Here at this institution, we embrace diversity, yet need to nurture compassion and kindness for one another, and more vocally challenge and expose injustice and oppression. When we hold ourselves to these higher standards, our expectations rise, and so do we rise above the colonialism of for its poor understanding of equality. We will not become the problem when we are, when we become the solution driven, when we become the solution to problems. Then we can improve our infrastructures, our systems, our processes, and our conduct to shape our futures, our safety and well-being and advanced our restorative practices with real, our real truth for justice. We must remain inspired by our ancestors' approach. I don't speak just for Kulnarikin, everybody has in um, First Nations society, First Nations ancestors. For their approach and their commitment in designing solutions and in visualising a future, guaranteed our children, your children, would experience the peace our ancestors once strived to achieve. Our roles now extend to dismantling structural barriers, empowering the marginalised and disempowered and advocating for natural justice and better community services that you yourselves can deliver. As we grow, let us bring our communities with us, creating a future where our children thrive. For continuing students, I encourage you, please use your voice as a student representative, shaping and improving policies and pro process practice to better support fellow students' experiences, their rights and their interests, and to be heard by this institution who must also guarantee for future students their aspirations will, will be supported 
and our ancestors that our ancestors so wisely provoked. Today, we carry a torch. We carry their torch of change, illuminated by the resilience of those who have walked before us. We draw strength from their unwavering determination to overcome adversity in deepening their connection to land and their profound respect for themselves, their cultures, and their communities. Let us use our education to build upon their unwavering determination to champion a society rooted in truth, justice, diversity, inclusivity, and reconciliation. As we move forward on our individual paths, May we never forget the lessons we have learned and the friendships we have forged. Recognise the incredible privilege we have been granted and embrace our, responsibility, embrace our responsibility as champions for positive change, advocates for social justice and ambassadors for peace building. Together, let us shape a future where First Nation cultures are celebrated, where every individual feels valued and safe, and where hope and inspiration burn brightly for the generations that are to come. I'd like to thank you um, for being so, uh, such an honourable listening audience, and may your journeys continue with strength and in the unity of peace. Thank you, Dr. Helen Bishop. We are now at the end of the ceremony. And before I invite everyone to join us in cutting and enjoying the graduation cake, I would like to say special thanks to you all for coming, congratulations graduates and visiting industry partners, Professor Bowman, the Vice Chancellor of CDE, thank you, and Dr. Bonnie Berger, Bonnie Berger um, and Melissa Piccolo from the Department of Education, Head of the Rate Program. Thank yous for coming. I would like to say a special thanks to the TIBA, Dream Media and First Nations Broadcasting for their ongoing involvement and support of Bachelor Institute. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the current Screen and Media students and trainers Patrick McKenzie and Heath Baxter for live streaming today's ceremony. Also, special acknowledgement also for our artist, Demi Gawalia, a student of Bachelor Institute, who painted the picture featured on today's graduation booklet, and Mr. Donnie McGuinness, our staff member, and Canarican traditional owner and custodian, who designed and crafted the beautiful designs on the sound artwork today, especially for this ceremony, under the tree outside to the right, in which you will see. You beat me to the punchline, I'll say please join me in a round of applause, but you did it before I could say that, so that's all good. <laughs> Graduates, after the ceremony and academic is completed, could you please meet at the sand for our 2023 graduation photo, where you will have a nice photo taken with all of you, the graduates, Uncle Speedy and Jack, and Mr. McGuinness. Therefore, I would now like to ask the Institute Council, Elder Uncle Speedy McGuinness and Jack McGuinness, to lead the academic procession from the grounds, ceremony grounds today. Thank you all for attending today, and please drive home thank you, safely. Thank you all.
ask um, guests and visitors to stand. Stay where you are, please, so our academic position can walk out. Thank you. Graduates. Let's give them a round of applause again. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you. 